When I was nine, I loved math. I loved it so much that I was moved up into higher math sets and spent my time learning about angles and triangles and long division years before my classmates. When I changed schools, I discovered that they no longer had higher math sets. And, like any nine-year-old, I got bored in math classes and moved on to pursuing other interests. At 13, my school finally offered harder math classes. Additional math, they called it. I wanted in. And although I didn't get 100% on all of my tests, I knew that I was good enough to do it. Well, apparently I wasn't. Ability wasn't the criteria. The reason, they said, was because I wasn't interested in math. I never did categorically find out what gave me that impression, but looking back, I realized that my love of shoes and shopping and pretty long hair didn't help. Never mind, I thought at the time. I would simply present my case and be moved into the class that I wanted. It wasn't full anyways. It didn't exactly work out like that. I was even discouraged by a member of the school's leadership team, telling me, the 13-year-old girl that I was at the time, you don't want to take additional maths. Your parents want you to do it. I want to take the class, I told him. Was it really that hard to believe? Apparently, yes, because I still wasn't moved to the class that I wanted. Yet I kept on fighting, and eventually we came to an agreement. If I got the highest grade achievable on every maths test for an entire trimester, I would be moved to the class that I wanted. And I did it. I won. But I was 13 at the time and easily impressionable, and being held at face value to my grades, that one moment has led to years of self-doubt, lack of confidence, and my self-worth being tied to the grades that I get. It has led to an unwavering belief that I need to outperform in order to be worthy of doing what I want. The sad truth is that I am not alone in my experiences. The sad truth is that I am comparatively lucky. I found solace in teachers that gave me book recommendations and spare lunch times and old textbooks from their own bookshelves. I found a community of people who believed in me more than I believed in myself. They gave me the strength to realize that we need to change. As educators and mentors and peers and parents and decent members of society, we need to change. There is now an unprecedented longing for female engineers in the working world. There's even a Women in Engineering Day. It's June 23rd, mark your calendars. My friends studying engineering at university often complain to me about how only the women get good internships nowadays. Companies are finally realizing the power of gender diversity. Yet for every one female engineer in the United States, there are 10 male engineers. Females make up only 14.5% of, of all engineers in the UK and only 13% in Canada. If we truly want to understand why there are so few women in engineering, we need to look at the young girls that they once were. The young girls who we continue subjecting to stereotypes, categorizing them in boxes before they even had time to realize who they are. The young girls that had to challenge the beliefs and conventions that they were presented with in an extremely early age. The young girls that formed their own minds, despite a lack of support from the people around them. At 11 years old, around 50% of girls would consider a career in engineering, compared to 70% of boys. At 12 years old, young girls are encouraged careers such as nursing, teaching, and medicine. The top three careers recommended to boys are engineering, IT, and finance. By 13 years old, more boys will be encouraged to think about engineering as a career than girls, particularly by parents. At 14 years old, only 94% of UK female students think that engineering is a suitable career for any gender, a percentage that is decreasing every year. At 15 years old, half of British young women do not even consider careers in STEM fields, setting a perception that the industries are sexist and a belief that STEM is better suited to the opposite sex. Until finally, at 16 years of age, only 25% of girls would even consider a career in engineering, compared to 50% of boys. How is it that in the span of five years, the number of girls considering engineering halves? How is it that the percentage of women who think engineers can be any gender decreases every year? How is it that we preach gender equality in all lines of work that still raise generations of women who cannot fathom, sorry, who cannot see themselves in STEM careers? The truth is, I have spent most of my life blissfully unaware of the misogyny which I grew up with. I didn't bend an eye when my art teacher told the girls to draw ponies while the boys drew rocket ships, or when teachers called for strong boys to stack the chairs while the girls picked up pencils. I, I couldn't care less when my dad shoved my brother the cool cars and big airplanes. I, I was a girl. I wasn't supposed to like those things anyways. But it is those moments, those ideals, which convince girls that they are incapable of becoming engineers. It is those unspoken biases which shape generations who cannot conceive that female engineers are equals 
their male counterparts. The problem at its root isn't so much the active discouragement of young girls from pursuing engineering, although that never helps. It is rather the passive discouragement. Us girls interested in studying engineering, we are told what an engineer could be, should be, would be, what an engineer is. And then there is us, and we are applauded, congratulated even, for being different. But that doesn't make the alienation disappear. That doesn't make young girls want to become engineers. If we truly want to solve the problem, if we truly care enough to do so, we need to redefine what it means to be an engineer in the first place. Being an archetypal engineer and being a girl oughtn't to be mutually exclusive, and we certainly ought not to tell young girls that it is. An engineer is intelligent and kind and logical, and above all, an engineer is passionate. Tell me if I'm wrong, but I cannot fathom that these traits are lacking in any of the young girls in your lives. I cannot fathom why anyone would try to convince them that they are. Over the past few years, I've also realized what an engineer is not. An engineer is not macho, nor strong, nor particularly well-built, and most of all, an engineer does not have to be a man. It is a simple sentiment, really quite easy to understand. The biases run deep, and unless we actively try to change the way that we talk about the engineering profession, any hope for lasting change is misfounded. The greatest irony in all of this, and perhaps the reason that you should care about the plight of the female engineer at all, is that we are hurting ourselves. When Apple launched the health app, it couldn't even track a female menstrual cycle because the team of male software engineers who designed it didn't find that feature necessary. The first all-female spacewalk was cancelled due to a lack of right-fitting spacesuits. Two women realized that they both needed the size medium suit, which NASA didn't have, because the average spacewalk is two large suits. The average spacewalk, that is, for men. When a woman is involved in a car crash, she is 47% more likely to be seriously injured, 71% more likely to be moderately injured, and 17% more likely to die. For decades, car crash dummies were based around the 50th percentile male. Researchers argued for the inclusion of a 50th percentile female in regulatory tests, but this advice was ignored by manufacturers and regulators. It wasn't until 2011 that the US first started using a female crash test dummy, a dummy that is still only used in the passenger seat. As male-dominated engineering continues, we will continue to create a male-oriented world, a world that will fundamentally discriminate against 50% of the global population. It's unacceptable. It's dangerous. We do not only need female engineers for the empowerment of women, but for the safety of the entire female population to ensure that engineering will help women as much as it does men. I'm now 17 and a senior in high school and have recently accepted an offer from Stanford University to study aeronautical engineering for the next few years of my life. As I'm looking towards this future, I can't help but look back at the 13-year-old girl that I, once, that I once was. <laughs> the girl who lost herself trying to meet standards that she never should have been upheld to in the first place. I can't help but be mad and upset and hurt that she was forced to expect so much from herself at such, a, at such a young age, and worst of all, that she is not alone in her experiences. I can't help but wonder what would have happened if that girl never existed, if no such girls were forced to exist. I'm sure that it would be a far happier world. I'm also sure that if we try, we will make such a happier world. So once you leave here, I ask only one thing of you. When you look at your daughters and nieces and sisters, when you look at the women of the world, Remind yourself that they are vulnerable to your biases and stereotypes, that they are at the mercy of whatever support you choose to give. Remind yourself that they are free to want to be anything, that they do not owe you certain futures. Remind yourself that the young girls we raise today are the hope that we give tomorrow. Thank you.